Daybreak, good to be with you today. I'm here in Little Italy in New York City and I want to introduce our speaker for today. And her name is Danielle Freed. I've known Danielle and tracked with her for a long time. And her and her husband are a part of the Daybreak family, which is so special today to have her with us, not only as a, a guest on the stage, but as a part of our family. Danielle is an amazing ministry leader. She came to Grand Rapids with her husband, John, her two beautiful children recently and they're on staff with the, the Great Lakes region of the Wesleyan Church. And Danielle's doing so many things, not only in our area, in our city, but in our region and in our nation to further the kingdom of God. And it is such a privilege for us here, not only as a part of our family, but to share the stage and to have her share the word with us this morning. So I want you to give a great welcome to her and her family, but please welcome today, sharing with us Danielle Freed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that awesome welcome, Pastor Jeff. We are so happy to be here and so honored to be a part of this church family. As Jeff said, my husband John and my son Dean are here in the front row. Our daughter's in hip town, Dayana. And we used to be um, church planters ourselves. We started a church in Indiana about 10 years ago, 10 of the best years of our lives. And smack in the middle of the pandemic, the Lord called us to move here to Hudsonville to join the Great Lakes region of the Wesleyan Church. And we are a part of that team helping start amazing churches like Daybreak all around the three-state region. And so we just happened to settle right here in Hudsonville, pumped to be so close to Daybreak. We love it here. Our daughter loves Hip Town. John and I have loved joining our small groups. Our son has had a great time checking out Fuel and Blood and hanging out with the teenagers. And so we just want to say thank you for welcoming us into your family. When you've been a pastor and you have to join a church, that's a weird feeling. And so a lot of you have really reached out to us and embraced us. And we just want to say Thank you. I have actually a picture of our cute little family. They are right here on the screen. Um, that's my husband, John. He'll actually be speaking next week. So you're in for a treat. I'm glad I'm going before him, although I'm not real sure I'm proud to have followed Troy because Troy was amazing last week. And I'm just not as cool as Troy. I don't know if you noticed. I'm not that cool, um, but I'm going to try. And then that's Dean and Diana. Do you see John? And Fozzie Freed, that's our little golden doodle. Um, we've met a lot of people here in Hudsonville because Fozzie likes to run away. And so when Fozzie runs away, we make new friends. We actually think God gave us that dog for that purpose. And so that's Fozzie Freed. He has a hashtag. If you ever see him running around town, just put that hashtag. Maybe somebody will find our dog and we'll come pick him up. And so that's a little embarrassing, but honestly, we're like, probably God gave us that dog for a reason. We also often are joining on Daybreak Live, so I want to say hi to all my Daybreak Live people because we travel a fair amount. You're probably like, they don't really go here. I never see them. No, we do. I promise. We just travel a lot. And so, hey, Daybreak Live, I'm with you a lot of Sundays, whether it's in the morning or later that week, joining and hanging out with the Daybreak Live crew. So, hello, Daybreak Live. We're glad you're here. My sermon title today is about everyday life, and I don't know if any of you or your kids have had this feeling of like... School's coming. <laughs> when we see the school supplies, pretty much every, everybody in our family starts to like have a hard time breathing because back to reality, back to early mornings, back to the grind, back to homework. And maybe you feel that way. Maybe you can feel a little bit of the summer is ending. We moved here from Indiana and they're already back in school. So feel sorry for them. Um, they've been in school for about a week. At least we have a couple weeks left to keep breathing. But today I want to focus on how do we spend our everyday life? How do we spend the time that God has given us? How do we not just spend Sunday morning, but after Sunday morning, how do we leave this place and how do we spend every day living on mission for the Lord? Uh, my scripture today is going to be out of Luke chapter 10. Pastor Jeff has set us up in foundations, just kind of talking about the foundations of the church and who we are as a church and why the church even exists. And today I'm going to talk very specifically about what we do when we leave this place, about how we live every day on mission. And Luke chapter 10 is a great guide for that. Pastor Troy had talked about last week, he said, the United States is now the third largest mission field in the world. And that kind of got my heart. I've heard that before, but it's alarming to hear that we are now the third largest mission field. We still send missionaries, but guess what? People are sending missionaries now to the United States. 
And that's kind of how John and I often see ourselves. We see ourselves as missionaries to the United States, looking at a community, looking at groups of people, looking for places of darkness and saying, how do we reach these people with the gospel? How do we reach them with the good news that you and I have found? Pastor Troy also said last week something that was kind of alarming. Again, I'm not as cool as him. I can't say it quite as cool, but he's like, this ship is on fire. Do I sound cool? No. Okay. Let me try again. This ship is on fire. Like, that's alarming, okay? I guess if you're on a ship and it catches on fire, that's really a problem. Like, yes, you're near water, but if there's a hole in the boat, we all know what happens. Titanic. So, the ship is on fire. It's alarming. It's concerning. And every day, you and I are interacting with people who don't know Jesus like we do. We have opportunities to step into their life, to share truth, to actually be the gospel in other people's lives. And so I just want to talk a little bit about that today, about specifically how we can do that. And I'm also very much a storyteller. So I have two awesome stories to tell you. Spoiler alert. Um, I love to just share like experiences that have changed my life and hopefully inspire you to step out and see life change happen in your life. So Luke chapter 10, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke chapter 10, talking about the mission that Jesus was sending these 72 people out on. It recently occurred to me, you know, we are also in the Bible. Like we're not just because Jesus loves us and he died for us. That's not the only part in the Bible that's about us. There's other parts that are like this missional piece, like we are being sent out. And I think the scripture is a great example of that. Jesus is appointing these 72 people to go out on his personal mission to prepare the people and towns for where he's about to show up. And I believe that he's still doing that right here, right now, in these communities that we all live in. He's preparing the way, he's opening the doors, he's ready to show up if we're just ready ourselves. So he says, the Lord now chose 72 other disciples, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. He sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places that he planned to visit. He has a plan. He's coming. He's ready to arrive. He's telling them, here's your instructions. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. There are a lot of fields around here. I don't know if you've noticed. That's different than where I'm from in Indiana. We have fields. We only grow corn and soybeans. It's really boring. I'm pretty sure there's spaghetti squash in my backyard last year, like a whole field of them and beautiful things. We are among these fields and not only are we growing beautiful fruits and vegetables and magical things that are delicious, but these are fields that the Lord's asking us to plow of people, of going out into our everyday life and reaching people for him. So the first instruction is to pray. Pray to the Lord who's in charge of this harvest. Ask him to send more workers into these fields and then go. Remember that I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves, and don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. This mission is very urgent. It's very concise. He's saying, don't take anything with you. Don't worry. Get moving. Get going. So my first point is that our, our mission is a continuation of Jesus' mission. The same mission, it wasn't just like, oh, these 72 people had a job to do. We have the same job to do. We're a continuation of that original mission. When we pray about this, that's the first thing that we can do is in the morning or in the midday or when we go to bed at night, just pray about how is the Lord sending us out on mission? Pray about who are the people I'm going to interact with? Who are the people that I work with? Maybe my neighbors. And praying that God would open doors and give us opportunities to make impact in their life. They, you've probably heard of something called the Great Commission, right? That's a very common phrase, a common scripture we talk about. But it's a great commission, not a great suggestion. It's not like, If you have time, this might be a good idea. No, it's a commission. It's a sending out. It's something that we've all been sent out on and we're being sent out on right now. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. So go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach these disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you even to the end of the age. So you're all probably looking at me going, right, yes, this is a good idea. Yes, I should do that, but I have some concerns. Well, I'm going to tell you what your concerns might be so that we can just get that out of the way. You might say, I don't share my faith or I don't go on mission and kind of share the gospel with people because I don't have enough knowledge about my beliefs and faith. Maybe that's a feeling that you've had. 
Or maybe you think, I don't have enough time to build a significant relationship so that I could feel like I could make that type of impact with somebody. Maybe you just have a fear of rejection. That's like the worst feeling ever, right? Like, no, I'm not interested. Okay. And you just like kind of walk away like the Girl Scout that's trying to sell cookies and we're like, no, I already bought some. Oh, no, I'm not interested. No, I'm a diet. It's that rejected feeling. Maybe you feel that way about the gospel. Maybe you're just thinking, I don't even know how to start that kind of conversation. Like, I've known this person for 20 years. So I'm going to be like, by the way, do you know Jesus? Or maybe that you feel like you're going to look like a hypocrite because maybe your faith hasn't always matched your actions. These are common fears. And even as a pastor, I can tell you, I have the same fears. Sometimes I feel like maybe I don't know enough. Maybe I can't answer their questions. Maybe they're going to be like, yeah, well, I saw the way you yelled at your kid. If that's what a Christian is, I'm not interested. We've all had these, we have these fears, we have these concerns and these worries, but have this really cool story that even still at this age, I'm 41, I'm not afraid to tell my age, at 41, I think back to this moment where I think the Lord was just beginning to shape something in me and helping me to realize like, hey, you don't have to have your act together. (laughs) You don't have to know the answers to all the questions. You just have to have enough faith to step out and do something for the Lord. I have a picture of a gym in Indiana. I had said to myself, I'm not going to be like Pastor Jeff and talk about basketball every sermon. But then it turns out, uh, us Hoosiers, Indiana people, we kind of just have to. Like, I heard him say once that basketball is a religion in Indiana. It's kind of true. So I played basketball, and I was also the mascot because I was a cheerleader. I'm from a really small town. You could do everything. But I broke my shoulder. And so um, the cheerleader would look like this, and so I couldn't do that anymore. So I became the bulldog mascot, which means I knew the cheers, but the arm was crooked and it was cool. So (laughs) we, um, this is similar to what it would look like at one of our county showcases. I don't know if you do that up here, but all the schools in the county come and they would just play like a quick, um, like one or two quarters, and it would just, you would just see all the players that are coming out for this season. It was super exciting, super fun. Every school in the county was there. Well, this one year, when I was 15 years old, I showed up to our little school student section, and there was this heavy set older man smack in the middle of our student section. And there was like 10 seats around him, like nobody wanted to sit next to this old man. Well, I am very outgoing. And I thought, you know what? We're going to have a great county showcase. I'm going to sit next to the old man. So I sit myself right down. I bring my friends around. And I'm like, hi, what's your name? He said, Howard. I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, I come to all the games. This is my thing. I said, well, you're in the student section. I don't know if you know that. He's like, this is where I always sit. I said, okay, well, then this is where I sit tonight. He began to kind of tell me some off-color jokes. And so I thought, okay, well, if you're going to be like that, I'm going to be like this. You need Jesus. And he laughed at me. He's like, I used to be a pastor. I said, no, you didn't. And he said, you're right, I didn't. And so I'm like, what am I going to do with this old man? Like, all, this, this county showcase is a long thing. It's basically like two games back to back. We're sitting with Howard. And I'm like, you really do need Jesus. He goes on and tells me, like, his wife died years ago. He's very lonely. This is what he does for fun. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with this old man? You know what? You should come to my church. And so it's like, there's a lot of old people there. You'll fit right in. I think you'll like it. And so I said, here's where my church is. This is what time it starts. When you come there, it's a small church. Everybody knows me. Just ask for Danielle. I'll find you. I'll make you some friends. And hopefully you'll find Jesus. Straight up just says this to the old man. Well, the next, that Sunday, the next day, I'm like, oh man, I invited an old man to church. What am I going to do with this old man? And so I'm like waiting in the lobby and I'm like kind of embarrassed. Like, what did I do? Like, what am I going to do with him? So I wait and I wait and I wait and he never comes. So I was like, okay, well, he didn't come. Too bad. So sad. Life moves on. Two months later, I'm at the same gym. I'm in the bulldog costume and someone's yanking on the tail. Something kids like to do. Very annoying if you've ever been a mascot. And I turn around and it's the old man. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's the old man, Howard. And so when you're the bulldog, you're not supposed to like show your face. You know, I said, I can't really talk to you right now. I'm kind of a big deal, you know? And so I like grab a piece of paper and a pen. I'm like, here's my phone number. Call me. He goes, I went to your church. I said, no, you didn't. He said, yes, I did. Nobody knew Danielle. I said, then you didn't come to my church because everybody knows me there. And so I said, here's my phone number. Call me. Now, anyone um, in the teenage range, don't do this. Don't give your phone number to strange men. (laughs) I just want to clarify that right now. 20-some years ago, it was a different world. 
whole different thing. So the old man calls me, and my parents are like, what's going on? I'm like, I met this old man. He wants to come to our church. I just need to tell him what's going on. So we talk on the phone. My parents listen on the other line because, like, this is really creepy. And I tell him where my church is, and so he comes for a visit. Well, in the process, I'm like, well, what's your address? You're so lonely. It's getting to be Valentine's Day. I'd like to send you a Valentine. And so just to be nice. And so I sent him a Valentine and I have my, I actually found this. This is a thing I've learned about daybreak. Like if you're going to speak here, you got to drag up like all these old pictures of yourself. That's what they do. So that's what we did all week. Um, I found this actual school picture of me at 15 years old. And I write my phone number on the back because you know, if poor Mr. Howard is lonely, he should give me a call. This is where it gets crazy. Howard, no exaggeration, gets in a serious car accident. My picture's in his wallet with my phone number on the back. They call me, okay? Do you know Howard? I said, I know him. Are you his granddaughter? I said, no, I'm his friend. And (laughs) uh, he's not my grandpa. And um, they're like, well, he is in serious critical condition. We need to know, do you know his clergy? Now, I'm 15 years old. I'm not a pastor yet. And I'm like, no, I I do know his clergy. I said, my pastor will come visit him. My pastor will visit anybody. So I give him the phone number to the church. I say, call my pastor. He'll go. Call the pastor. I'm like, Pastor Dave, funny story. That old man, he got in an accident. He's going to die. Go make sure he knows Jesus. So Pastor Dave goes. Howard makes a full recovery. He begins coming to church after the accident in a little wheelchair. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do? Like, now I have an old man in a wheelchair. I have to help push around, have to help him get around the church, make friends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The story winds up really crazy. And I, the whole point is this. When you step out in very basic, simple faith, show someone some love, care, and concern, God can do incredible things. I was gone for about three weeks to summer camp, and I come back to church. And my aunt says, Danielle, you have to come here. I said, what? She's like, you're not going to believe what happened to Howard while you were gone. I'm like, I'm sure I won't. Like, this story has gotten really out of hand and crazy. And this is where it takes the craziest turn of all. Howard started dating Aunt D, my great aunt. (laughs) And truly, Uncle Howard is his new name. (laughs) That's my Uncle Howard. He has since gone to be with Jesus. But he married my great aunt Dee. They were both two very lonely people. They were super involved in church. They took bus trips to see baseball games. They, of course, kept going to the high school basketball games. But because of this one simple act of 15-year-old Danielle, who is quite a spaz, by the way, stepping out in faith and saying, hey, you need Jesus. You should come to my church. Howard's entire life was changed. If, thank you, I take no, I take no credit. That's just an example of saying, like, what could happen? Even if it's somebody completely different. I mean, I couldn't be any different than that old man in that picture right there. Like, we have zilch in common, except now we apparently have a family member. Um, It's just to say, if a 15-year-old girl at a basketball game could do something like that, with that little bit of faithfulness, what could God do with your faithfulness? I believe that we're being sent out on a mission every single day. I have this picture of lambs among wolves. This is a huge responsibility, something that we are all being called to do. And he says, remember, I'm sending you out, if you could show that picture of our everyday life of lambs among wolves. It's a pretty powerful picture. Hopefully it's there. Maybe it's not there. Of a lamb. So it's a picture. I'll describe it in case it's not there. It's a lamb looking over this hill. And it's this like herd of wolves, which we've heard this. I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. What does that even mean? What it means and what I loved about that picture is this lamb is looking out over this pack of wolves just with confidence. He's not afraid. He should be really afraid. He's not afraid at all. He's confident and he knows that he's on a mission from the Lord. He doesn't give notice to this pack of wolves. He just stands in brave confidence. 2 Corinthians 6 1 says, As God's co laborers, we beg you not to toss aside this marvelous message of God's great kindness. There are people around you every day. It may not be an old man at a basketball game, or it may. It may be somebody you see in a park. It may be a coworker, a neighbor. It may be an extended family member or a close family member. And I just want to give you one quick tip a simple way that you can look for ways to invite people into either church or into the gospel. There are three T words, transition, tension, or tragedy. And maybe this is true in your own story. If you think about when you really experienced the gospel or maybe when you accepted Jesus for the first time, it's highly likely that you were in one of these places, 
a place of transition. So whether that's that you just moved or you started college or you started high school, some type of job transition, maybe that was your story or that you're in a place of tension. A lot of times people that are in a hard place in their marriage or hard time with their kids, this is when they'll start to turn to faith. Maybe there's tension in your work or tension in extended family relationships. This is a place where people will often turn to faith. And the last one is a tragedy. Whether it's a tragic loss, something that they've experienced at work, something that they've seen. When you hear these things in people's lives, that should be like a little light bulb moment. Like, you know what? Maybe I should share Jesus with them. Maybe it's somebody you've known a long time and you're like, so how do I actually like bring the gospel to this person when we've never even had that conversation? We've been friends for like 20 years. Look for one of these T's. This is a great like light bulb moment to go, you know what? This is the time. This is the time that I can say, well, you know what I do in this situation? Or you know how I would handle something like that? Obviously with love, but those are three just tips I wanted to give you guys to think about transition, tension, or a tragedy. You don't have to have all the answers. <laughs> you don't have to answer the hard questions for people. You can very, very easily just say, hey, like, I'd love for you to join me at church. Or could I pray for you about that? It is almost never that if you ask someone if you could pray for them that they're gonna say, yeah, no. They will almost always say, sure, I would love that. We are God's plan A to save the world and there is no plan B. And my third point is after I find it, this everyday mission is urgent. Um, we talked about this a minute ago about how he says like, don't need to take any extra shoes. Don't pack, pack a bag. Like don't stop and talk to anybody, get going. There's an urgency. And as Pastor Jeff and Troy talked about last week, like how rapidly our world is changing. This is an urgent matter. This is something that we really need to pray about and put our hearts and our passion into. If you're not sure, you know, exactly who or where God's sending you, it may be to just a different place. It may be to a place where there's darkness. A question I ask people a lot of times is, what's the last thing that really made you cry? Like, not because your feelings were hurt or you were angry with somebody, but something that touched your heart so deeply that emotions welled up inside of you. What's the last thing that, like, whoa, got your attention? You were like, huh, I can't really handle that. Like, I, that bothers me. That hurts me. That may be a place of brokenness or of darkness that the Lord's calling you into. That may be something that you're saying, okay, like there, I am uneasy in my spirit about that. I do feel sad and concerned about that. Maybe I should do something about that. When I was a pastor in Indiana about five years ago, seven years ago-ish, we had a group of people in our church who were beginning to feel called, mostly of women, beginning to feel called to a ministry to adult dancers. And I thought, that's great. That's a place of darkness. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of brokenness in those types of places. They should do that. Go team. And then they invited me to come and just begin praying for them about that ministry. And I said, okay, well, I can pray. Like, that's the one thing that I can do. Um, I'll, I'll come to this meeting and I'll pray, about, pray for this awesome ministry to these people. And when I came to the meeting, I heard this lady's story who started this ministry. And she said, women who are in the exotic dancing industry, their life expectancy is 260 times lower than people, other people their age. So the chances that they're going to die is 260 times quicker than people basically my age at that time. And when I found that out, that was because of illnesses, addictions, abuse, it like gripped my heart. So these people are going on a mission to reach people who are 260 times more likely to die just because of their career, the risk involved in that. And we want to go and share Jesus with them. I think I should probably do that. Like I was overcome with emotion. So the lady who started this ministry, she just felt like God was really calling them to bring light to one of the darkest places. What you might think happens in these type of clubs is probably true, but what you may not know is there's worse things that happen. There are murders surrounding these types of clubs, drug addictions, illegal drug dealing, much other <laughs> illegal things happen in these places, and it's dangerous. It's not like, oh yeah, let's go hang out there tonight. 
And so there's this whole process of how you get trained. You have to have certain people in the parking lot praying. You have to be a married woman to go inside. And so I just was overcome with like passion and love for these people. And I thought, well, I have to go do that. And so I began this incredible ministry. We were there in the club one night. We go kind of early in the evening because the later it gets, the less safe it is. And a girl approached our table. Now, we would often go with this 65-year-old lady. And so we kind of stuck out. It was like not the normal clientele. And so we were with this older lady and one or two other younger ladies. And a server approached our table. And she said, hey, I've been waiting for you guys to come in. And we're like, us? Like, with grandma? Uh, Okay. And so what do you mean? And she's like, well, she's like, You guys were here last week, which I wasn't there the week prior, and neither was this other girl with me, but the older lady was with us. And she said, one of you guys left a note on the table and said that the meaning of my name, Amanda, is worthy of love. And I've been thinking about getting a tattoo, and when I saw that napkin, I just knew that was going to be my new tattoo. I was like, you're kidding. (laughs) And she's like, yeah, I have it right here, right here on my side. And I was like, okay, okay. Uh, well, you know, funny thing, I'm pretty sure I know who would have written that because we had a friend who was really obsessed with names and the meaning of names. She's very artistic. She even had a few tattoos herself. And so I said, she would be like so excited that that happened. Can I take a picture of it? And she's like, yeah, come back over here. So she pulls up her shirt, take a picture of the tattoo on her side. It's really, really big and really, really cool. And I'm overcome by like the power of those words, worthy of love, working in a place like this, And I don't really know what to say (laughs) because I'm just so like, okay. Uh, So I ask her how she likes her job, which is not the right question. I wasn't trained very well. And so she's like, well, um, it's okay. She said, I got this job because I am divorced and I have two kids and I was working two jobs seven days a week and I realized if I worked somewhere like this, I would only have to work about three days a week and make twice as much money. So this is where I'm at. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. She's like, what do you do? I was like, oh, gosh. Um, Well, uh, I'm married. My husband and I are pastors. We start churches, like a special kind of church, like churches where people who don't really normally go to church would go to church. And she's like, oh, yeah, I understand that. My ex-husband was a pastor. He cheated on me. I'm like, okay. (laughs) Okay. I'm really sorry to hear that. And I'm just so flustered. I mean, I have to be honest with you. I'm not going to be like, and so there I just prayed with her and it was amazing. I was like, why am I here? What is happening? I am a pastor. My husband's a pastor. My husband hasn't cheated on me. We have two cute kids. We have a great job. Like I'm so different than her in this moment. And so I just get kind of awkward to be honest because I didn't have all the answers. I didn't know exactly what to say. And I just kind of like go back to the table and she goes back and does her job. Then she approaches our table. You guys are like, this lady exaggerates. She has crazy stories. No, this is true. This is what happens. So she approaches our table and she says, you know, I kind of know what you guys are about. And I just wanted to ask you if you would pray for me. I have cancer and I have my sixth treatment tomorrow. She has cancer. Her pastor husband had an affair on her. She's got these two kids. She's working this job and she has cancer and is in the middle of treatments right now. Again. I didn't know what to do or say. I'm just sitting there like feeling guilty, to be honest, and feeling like stupid and I don't know what on earth to do or say. And so not me, not not this older lady who's a Bible professor, but my friend Megan, who's 23 years old at the time, she reaches over and grabs her hand and says, can we pray for you? I'm like, yes, Megan, that's what we should have done. Good call. And so... (laughs) Because I'm just like, uh, uh. and so she holds her hand and just prays, prays for Amanda and prays that God would heal her and that God would heal her heart and her body and her family and make her whole. I don't really know exactly what happened to Amanda. The one thing I do know is that because we stepped out in obedience, because we went to a dark place and brought light, whether she likes it or not, unless she pays a lot of money, the rest of her life, this girl is very aware that she's worthy of love. How powerful is that statement when you realize her story, that she's worthy of love? I don't have all the answers. I'm not telling you that I'm perfect at this, but I want to ask you, would you be willing to take one step towards a dark place? Would you be willing to be aware of where darkness might be in your day-to-day life? 
Is there somebody you work with, somebody you know, a neighbor that you're like, you know, they're kind of a downer. They're kind of like a sad person or they're going through something, a tension, a tragedy, a trial of some sort and take one step towards them. Daybreak's an awesome church. They're nailing it on the invitation thing. Um, I think I get one in my mailbox every week. And I love that, by the way. I'm like, yes, my church sent another mailer. There are tons of invitations in the back. And I would love for that entire stack of invitations to be gone today. That if the Lord's put somebody on your heart, or you're just saying, yeah, you know what? I don't have all the answers, just like Danielle said. But I'm willing to step out and invite some people. Grab some invitations. Invite them to church. Or take one step and just start praying for a person. Or just ask a person if you can pray for them. The other day, John was out front in our neighborhood, and our neighbor was saying how her dad's going through some hard things. And so she just said, can I pray for He said, can I pray for you right now? And she was like, yeah, yeah, you can. We don't really say very well. Like, we've only lived here a year, you know? But, like, she knows that we care. And that's one step closer to her experiencing the Jesus that's in us. Pastor Jeff said, we are called to, work in, to walk into this world and be the light of God. We're called to bring hope to the hopeless, to be a friend to those who have no friend, to welcome in the outcast. We're called to help the poor, watch over those who are defenseless, and bring justice and righteousness into this world. I want to pray that we would do that as a church. I want to pray that even today and this coming week, God would give us opportunities to be that. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this group of people, those in the room and those watching online, who are listening and tuning their hearts to say, where is a dark place? Where is their pain? Where is their hurt? Where are people that I know who don't know Jesus like I do? Where are there people who could use a dose of hope, who could use a friendship, who could use a Jesus in their life like I have in my life? And so I just pray, God, that we would each be obedient that we would walk in confidence, that we would, even if it feels uncomfortable, invite people into your church, invite people into a relationship with you, invite people to allow us the privilege just to pray for them. And Lord, that because of our obedience, we would see multiple lives changed, that em- any empty seat in this room would begin to be filled with people who don't yet know you like we do, and that we would be faithful in living on this mission for you every day in our lives. We know, Lord, that when we expect you to show up, you will show up. And so we're asking you, Lord, to do that in our lives and in the lives of those around us. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much, Daybreak, for having us. Hope that you guys have an awesome Sunday. It's going to be like 91 degrees here in West Michigan. So go enjoy the end of your summer. You're dismissed.